and with the Catholics. Good morning and welcome to this live stream from the European Parliament here in Brussels. And uh, we're very well welcomed, especially to those who are joining us on uh, almost all the social media channels of the Parliament. Uh, today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Transphobia and Interphobia. Uh, and uh, we are going to discuss today with my guests uh, the progress made so far in the EU and uh, the current challenges. I'm joined uh, uh, for this discussion by the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Mezzola, uh, and two uh, members who co-chair the Parliament Group on, uh, that monitors the EU LGBTIQ uh, actions, Marc Angel and Terry Reintke. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. If you want to be part of this uh, discussion, you only have to put uh, your comment or questions in the comment section. And I'll put as many as I can to my guest, uh, President Metzola. What, is, in your opinion, are the most pressing issues today when it comes to LGBTIQ rights in the EU? Well, I think this parliament has uh, stood for a very long time in pushing uh, against uh, resistance in a number of countries uh, for progress uh, of equality. Uh, and this is the day Every year I say I wish we don't have to have a day where we need to remind everyone where uh, we still lag behind. Uh, but the European Parliament and the European Union, you can say, is a beacon for where those rights have seen the biggest leap, both in terms of legislative changes, but also in terms of societal changes. We are still very far away, but at least we can very much with colleagues, and it's a real honor for me to be with Thierry and with, and with, with Mark, in order to push a little bit for better equality uh, and recognition and understanding of people's wish to live in the world as they want to live. Stryber on Instagram is asking, uh, what, can, what is the parliament doing? Can you mention a few uh, legislative actions uh, that the parliament has taken recently to... To, to, to combat these forms of discrimination? Well, we can make a distinction between the political actions, so for example, some ones of symbolism today for the first time um, uh, on all our offices across the world in all the member states, but also here in Strasbourg and in, in Luxembourg, uh, we are flying uh, the flag on all our buildings. Uh, and we have also taken the decision that this will happen automatically every year without a every specific year. decision to be taken. Uh, secondly, uh, we have a number of internal decisions whereby, as an institution, we still need to do much more yes. in order to, to help um, uh, rainbow families grow with, their, with the children uh, and, and how they, uh, they need to, to receive the same rights as anybody else, irrespective of their marital um, status or gender status at home. Uh, so a lot of work is being done in that regard and we have very, very good uh, staff organizations but also members uh, that push for more rights. And then, of course, uh, we are always the first institution to condemn uh, attacks uh, in, in, in other countries but also in member states. And, you cannot imagine how often we find ourselves together and say we have the perfect laws uh, on paper, but still people are, are being attacked in schools, they are being bullied, they are being isolated, and there isn't enough training, education, but also, let's say, push back against any attempts to sideline or segregate uh, and, and isolate. And that, I think, is where the European Parliament needs to push much more. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next two years and maybe when we meet again, in one year's uh, time uh, and look at what the intergroup, which is a group that brings members together from all political groups uh, as to where we have arrived and where we still have to go. Uh, Ms. Angel, do we have a reason to celebrate? Uh, one more reason to celebrate this year? What, are, wh what progress has been made in, combat in combating hate and uh, discrimination against the LGBTIQ community? We have a reason to celebrate, but we also have a reason to be sad because there is backlashes in mm. some countries. But today, I want to be positive and I want to say that uh, in the European Parliament, we have had 91 resolutions since the beginning of the mandature where, uh, w which were specific LGBTI or where there was some uh, articles uh, concerning LGBTI people. So we've been very active and I think that is a reason to celebrate this uh, active European Parliament when it comes in, in defending uh, LGBTI rights and when it comes to protecting LGBTI rights. 
we also are very happy that this commission now has for the first time a commissioner for equality and this is important too and the commission president is also very much committed Mrs. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen for a union of equality and the parliament is a strong ally to the commission in realizing this union, union of equality and I think we should celebrate that but not forget that there is backlashes not forget that there is hate speech not forget that there is a strong anti-gender movement who wants to bring us back into patriarchy who is attacking not only LGBTI rights but also women's rights and I think therefore we have to be strong and celebrate uh, today. Uh, you mentioned uh, women's rights as well, uh, the intersectional approach mm -hmm. to this, to LGBT rights. How important is this? And how important is it to address it uh, also when it comes to legislations and actions? Mm -hmm. I think for the European Parliament and I think inside of the intergroup where we are working across border and also across member state, we now have members from, from all member states of the European Union. Um, an intersectional approach is very important to us because we see that the attacks that Mark and Roberta were already speaking uh, about um, are also coming uh, towards different groups um, yeah. and that they are trying to really roll back on rights that have been fought for and that have already been uh, acquired uh, in a lot of ways. So um, we try to uh, really counter that together um, and to obviously stand up for LGBTI rights, um, to mention the, the strategy, for example, where we are going to push for recognition of parenthood all across the European Union between member states. Um, we are looking forward to um, adding hate crimes to the list of uh, EU crimes, which I think will be a very important step mm -hmm. to safeguard uh, our community. Um, but we also look beyond that, um, how we can work to fight against racism, how we can work to uh, promote the rights of uh, people with disabilities. And I mean, always, if you talk about these groups, there is an overlap because they are, you know, um, people from the LGBTI community who are facing racism, people from the LGBTI community um, who, who have disabilities, and we are trying to really see that together, to, to have a full picture, and then to horizontally fight against all forms of discrimination because we want to live at the end of the day in societies, in the European Union, where everybody can live freely and free from discrimination and free from violence. And yet, uh, we, uh, we see the numbers. According to uh, this uh, report, uh, this uh, survey is pretty old because it's like almost three years old, but uh, still. In 2019, the European Agency, uh, Union Agency for Fundamental mm. Rights found that discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity expression, and sex characteristics was actually increasing. 43% compared to 37% to, uh, in 2012. How do you interpret these figures? How do you, as a politician, see Do, do you uh, Do you see that there is a regress in this uh, sense? I think uh, I would interpret it in that way that yes, there is regression. We see very aggressive and systematic campaigns against the LGBTI community. And I have to mention Poland and Hungary as the two, I think, worst examples. But certainly there are problems in all EU member states. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that the LGBTI community is being scapegoat for societal problems and um, that there is this kind of narrative that we are a threat to society. And I think we have to very firmly stand against that. But I would also say that when we look at, for example, the FRA survey, that we can see that maybe also issues that were already there before are coming more to the surface because we talk about the issues more and also people feel that they can speak about discriminations that they are encountering, that they can report it to the police. And I think that is why it's important to stand firmly against any kind of queer phobia, but at the same time also to really highlight these issues because only when we address them, we can actually raise awareness around them and then change society for the better. Can I jump in here? Uh, because of what Terry says is, is, is really important about when you collect data, where it comes from uh, and how many uh, citizens of the EU, let's focus on, on the European Union, people who live in our countries, actually report incidents mm -hmm. that are committed against them. We have seen an increase uh, in some countries, but in others because of, uh, of uh, let's say, societal being uh, led by governments that are allowed to push it down, to, for, for example, for reports not to be made in order to, to disincentivize the possibility for you to say this is not okay, for parents to be able to tell the children, listen, be careful now because this is coming in, in this and this country. And if I can look back uh, to countries like mine that joined the European Union with that hope of protection 
for all rights for everyone, then what we are also seeing is that countries that once they enter the EU, they think that nobody's going to keep check on them, nobody's going to control what's happening, and you can backslide, as, as Terry mentioned, uh, in specific countries, and we are seeing this across the board. So what we, I think, have to do as a European Parliament, first of all, is to be uh, not only the promoter, but the reminder that those rights exist, mm. encourage reporting, but also in this building, for example, if something happens, you are going to be protected. Mm. And it is not always obvious that that is the case mm. and that is known to be the case. And uh, you all mentioned the uh, discrimination and hate speech, but this sometimes uh, uh, President Metzola is coming from politician. Uh, it does um, somehow fuel this sort of hate Absolutely. crimes. So uh, what are the dangers of this re rhetoric, you think? Yeah, we see it. We see it everywhere, uh, in this house, in all countries, uh, and that is a very dangerous and increasing, I don't even want to call it phenomenon, but increasing fact. Uh, what we have done, however, uh, in this parliament is establish a very, let's say, constructive pro-European uh, uh, centre of the house, let's mm. call it that, whereby we can fight against that. Because mm. if we don't, it is so easy to use populist narrative that verges on hatred, to have that hatred pass by because we think it's going to go away if we don't fight, if, if we try to uh, uh, not to do anything about it. And for many years, we actually looked away or allowed too much to be said when it was unacceptable for it to be said. And if, you, if we look at, for example, what has happened, very difficult to two years uh, within, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, and we are now seeing an increase of cases because of societies reopening, people meeting together and therefore um, uh, um, attacks increasing. We have seen that uh, coming, coming our way uh, in all cities across the European Union. What we have seen in this house is that where there were attempts to create uh, so-called LGBTIQ free zones, uh, something I didn't know existed as a word. When I stood up and said, look, you know, uh, for me, this is not something that can be acceptable uh, in, in the European Union. And we were joined by colleagues from most groups in this in this house and it is that constructive core that needs to push back against the increase of, of 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 attacks speeches and it is our responsibility especially as elected representatives not to let that easy populism take hold especially when looking in the next two years when we are going to start preparing for our elections in 2024. And we all have that responsibility. No one can exonerate himself or herself from it. Uh, you mentioned, uh, yes, rightly so, the, the infringement procedures, that the, the, the hate speech that has been going on in some countries, especially the Hungary and Poland, where there were uh, concrete attacks on the LGBTIQ community. Um, is... Uh, what so the, the Commission also launched the infringement procedure. Is this enough? And what else can be done, uh, Mr. Angel, to, to, to ensure equal treatment of the LGBTIQ community uh, for people, no matter where they live in the EU? Well, first of all, it took the Commission a long time to, to, to get into infringement procedures for Poland and Hungary. And we and the Parliament, we're really pushing that, that there's also a, a suivi that they will, uh, that there is a follow up of that and uh, they can count on us that we, we will because we've been in contact with activists in Poland and Hungary. We've visited Poland and Hungary and we see the situation there. And these people there, they believe in Europe, they believe in our values, they believe in the European Union, so we cannot disappoint them. So really, uh, I hope uh, that uh, these infringement procedures will come to a, a, a positive end. At, uh, um, well, that's, but um, but uh, uh, I just wanted to come back to what uh, Roberta said before this uh, parliament. We have so many allies. This resolution, when we declared the European Union as an LGBTI freedom zone, was voted by 498 members of this parliament out of 705. And that made me proud as a gay man. It made me proud that we have allies, that, that my rights are respected by my colleagues. And this is, I think, was a very strong message also to the to the, uh, uh, our friends in Poland and in Hungary, that they know there is a strong group in Brussels. The European Parliament stands for your rights. Mm -hmm. um, here in the EU, uh, we pride ourselves so, uh, uh, when it comes to 
anti-discrimination laws uh, for, uh, against the LGBTQIQ community. Uh, but the, as member states have different legislations when it comes to, to free movement of families, for example, uh, it is often difficult for these rainbow families mm -hmm. to, to move from one country mm -hmm. uh, uh, to another and exercise their treaty rights, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned here the case of Bulgaria. There was an ECJ uh, uh, ruling on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what can we do to defend the free rights of movement or the, 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 their treaty rights, actually, for couples, for rainbow couples who find themselves in difficulties mm -hmm. and sometimes their children risk being, uh, becoming stateless? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I first start by saying yes. you're right that uh, the European Union has come a long way uh, in terms of anti-discrimination policies and especially coming from a conservative member state like Germany. Germany wouldn't be where it is today um, fighting discrimination if it wasn't for the European Union. I think that has to be said. But at the same time, we also have the Horizontal Equality Directive that has been blocked now for many, many years in Council, which would actually be the next step in really providing uh, protection from discrimination on all grounds of discrimination in all sectors of our society. So to really fulfill that promise of the European Union to protect people from discrimination, we really urgently need to, to add that to the list of policies that we have. But you're absolutely right. We have a very specific a challenge for rainbow families. Um, and I mentioned already in the strategy, um, there is a very positive proposal um, that uh, the member states are supposed to recognize parenthood. So for example, birth certificates, adoption certificates yeah. between each other so that we don't create a situation where a family just exercising their right to freedom of movement mm -hmm. moves from, I don't know, mm -hmm. Finland to Poland and then maybe loses their legal status towards, towards each other. And um, so we really want to make sure um, that, that this changes. But uh, if I may add, um, the intergroup in the European Parliament would also like to extend this not only to parenthood, but also to partnership, because we believe obviously there is a very specific protection needed for children. But we also don't want, for example, couples who are married in one member state to move somewhere and then not be married anymore in that other member state. So I think that there is um, still a lot of work to do to, to make sure that all people in the European Union, including rainbow families, can really fully exercise their right to freedom of movement as EU citizens. If I could come in yes, here, please. The, <clears throat> the petition committee of this uh, parliament has been very active mm -hmm. on the free movement of rainbow families. And we have this fantastic European Parliament Research Service, which made a fantastic research document That's of true. about 100 pages on the, free move, on the barriers to free movement of rainbow families. So, uh, and then we voted a resolution, again, which had a good majority here, where we, 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 we asked for, for this uh, direct and the Commission has promised it. So uh, the, 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 the Parliament is really also defending uh, the rainbow families. I, I can maybe draw parallels with what happened uh, over 10 years ago in, a, in a, not a similar but on the way. I remember one of the, the very first reports uh, I, I uh, had uh, to shadow in this house was Ulrike Lunacek's report ah, in yes, 2013, which was a roadmap against homophobia. It was difficult to get that mm. through um, uh, with the majorities that we wanted to have. And if you compare the wording, how much, let's say, less ambitious it was, mm. because that was the maximum that the mm. parliament could achieve, which led to then the commission coming back, as Mark mentioned earlier, you know, with the current program, with a commissioner dedicated uh, to equality. And Helena works, uh, very, works very well uh, and very much in that regard. Uh, in, but if I also look back from a legal perspective, so I talk as a lawyer now, uh, we have been struggling uh, in the European Parliament, for example, and we did that for years, to recognize divorce judgments from one country to another. Yeah. That took almost 10 years to achieve. Maintenance, in other words, when you divorce, who pays for children? Um, uh, um, uh, which of the spouses would pay for the children if they move country? And that is fundamentally what we have said as EU member states, that what the judge in Luxembourg gives us a decision, a judge in Malta needs to execute. Doesn't always happen, and that is not possible. As you mentioned, it's not a treaty right, but it's a, it's a regulation right. In other words, there are regulations that oblige member states to do that. And if you think about who is suffering, you have 
people who simply want to have their union recognized uh, from one country to another, to have access to social services, to health, to education, to, as we, as we have seen in a, in a pandemic, we had a lot of cases of families that were got stuck in countries where their rights and their status was not recognized. We are in 2022. I think we can really for, at, at, finally say that if there is one country in the European Union, we share the values, we push for that, same principles, same fundamental rights, they have to be recognised elsewhere and enforced, more importantly, because also, as, as Terry said, it's not as always about the children who have a right to, to the family life that they enjoy in the country where they were born or where they are being brought up, but also with people who have chosen a union that is recognised and legalised in one country that has to be recognised by another. No excuses. It's not possible to accept that. And uh, uh, one of the Commission's LGBT equality strategy, one of the main pillars, in, is the use role in the, in the world and uh, the promotion of human rights. In your opinion, do you think safeguarding the human rights and LGBT rights in particular should be at the heart of EU's external policy? Uh, this is something that is at the core of our external policy and in fact, uh, I spend a lot of my time meeting with representatives from, uh, from countries in, in outside the European Union where, of course, uh, the recognition and the rights and the protection is, is, is far behind what the European Union has done. And in fact, that is why it is so important when we talk about the European Union as being a safe shelter for persons who are escaping persecution in member states because of their sexual orientation. Uh, this afternoon, in fact, I will have a a meeting with a Ugandan LGBTIQ activist who is going to send that message that the European Union needs to continue to be uh, that beacon of the world that protects uh, and shelters. That's why also we push in our trade policy, in our, our trade policy for very strong human rights uh, mm. uh, chapters. And even now we, have a, we are working on a modernization of a trade uh, um, agreement with Chile where we have even a gender chapter in it. And I think that's the future to also put that in our trade policy because uh, uh, we cannot tolerate that there is countries where, where LGBTI people are, are, are persecuted, even uh, you know, that there is still countries where there's a death sentence for, for same-sex yeah. relations. And can I add that especially... May I, I think... just add that you, oh, yeah, you have sorry. been very vocal also when it comes to, to, to non-EU countries like Turkey and other Balkan mm -hmm. countries. Is it also important to, 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 to make sure that these uh, rules, this, uh, this, uh, the rights and fundamental rights of people are safeguarded when it comes to, uh, to also um, dealing and negotiating with potential candidate countries to the EU? Absolutely. I think that um, the safeguarding of fundamental rights, rule of law, democracy has to be a priority also in accession negotiations. And I think that we have come a long way there as well, because I think it didn't used to be a priority as it is now, because I feel that now when we speak, for example, about the accession of countries from the Western Balkans, when we speak about our relationship with Turkey, um, this has become much more of a, of a topic that is being discussed. I, th I still think we can, you know, listen even more to the activists on the ground specifically because in the intergroup we are always working. Obviously, we do parliamentary work, but what is also important for us is really to include the community in every single decision that is taken because at the end of the day, the people from the LGBTI community know best what they need. And um, so I think that there we can even do better, especially when we talk about accession. Um, but if I can just add the thought, and I think that this is also true for accession, the Western Balkans, Turkey, now Ukraine. Uh, when we look at the world, you know, we see that this, um, this struggle between democratic societies and autocracy, you know, authoritarian rule regimes, um, that this is really sort of fueling, especially now with the war in Ukraine, where Russia, an autocratic state, has, um, has attacked a democracy. And I think that when we talk about what makes democracies, what, you know, what is kind of the core of democracies, it is also next to obviously having democratic elections, having a system based on rule of law. It is also the safeguarding of fundamental rights for all people in society. So I think especially in this sort of world situation that we are in right now, Roberta spoke about the EU being a, a safe haven for LGBTI people, but I also think a beacon of hope that uh, we live in societies where this struggle for fundamental rights, for democracy, for rule of law um, uh, is working, where we are moving forward, where we make progress. I think a lot of people in the world look at the European Union and say it's working there and this also gives us hope that we can move forward um, with this. Um, so I think that this makes our work inside of the European Union, but also 
outside in the mm -hmm. external relation regarding LGBT, uh, LGBTI rights even more important? Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Angel, uh, we have a question from Instagram from Sam who says, has the EU made any progress uh, in combating hate and discrimination against uh, uh, um, uh, LGBTIQ community? Then how can we educate? Uh, how can the EU help to educate uh, uh, people on LGBTIQ issues to make this society, our societies more inclusive? Well, uh, progress, certainly we have done it. We've talked about the progress and when it comes to education, I think is, and this is something we as a parliament also defended in many resolutions. It's very important that in schools, in all the member states, we have comprehensive uh, uh, sexual and relationship uh, education, mm -hmm. not only sexual education in the way how mm -hmm. to, to not become pregnant or to become pregnant, but the whole, the whole relationship around it and comprehensive sexual education means also talking about uh, uh, trans identity Identity, about gender identity, about intersex people. So to inform, informing is, is, is very important. And from every age, at this education has to be age adapted. And this makes uh, young people also much more resilient against the tax. It, it, it helps uh, building up prejudice. Uh, and I think this is, this is very important that it starts in school very early, educating uh, that, that LGBTI rights are human rights, women's rights are human rights, and, and, and not tolerate that uh, some political leaders with hate speech try to divide mm -hmm. the societies, but bring societies together. You know, fighting for LGBTI rights, it's not that we're fighting for extra rights. Mm, exactly. It's just fighting uh, for non-discrimination, fighting to have the same rights as every other rights and obligations as any other EU citizens. That's what is the fight for LGBTI rights. How important is it to have uh, representation, not only in politics, but also in art, media, and et cetera, in institutions? Uh, how important is it so that we can give an, a message to young people out there that uh, it is possible, that uh, their freedoms are safeguarded? Representation, representation in terms, in terms, of, terms of activism like, or represent uh, representation in terms of having uh, LGBTIQ politicians who yeah. are more active in politics, yeah, yeah, yeah. but also not only, also mm. in other. Uh, I have of met mind. so many uh, politicians uh, from my country and in other countries uh, who are part of the LGBTI community who tell you, I can't say, I can't mm. say, mm. because I uh, would not get elected, or I can't say because I will be only identified with mm, that as that. Yeah. As mm, that. Mm. Uh, and that has made me think quite a lot in terms of how we balance between the fights that you fight and how you are, as Terry said, the beacon of hope because we can do it uh, because we, are, uh, we have seen how what we say, what we do, what we decide in terms of laws that we adopt, it actually makes a difference in people's lives. I, uh, I have four boys. I would like that all the teachers in my, that teach my children uh, actually tell them and educate them uh, and so that they are, let's say, aware of what... Uh, they need or how they need to be or how they but to be honest when I had this conversation with them it's almost like well, well of course these are obvious uh, these are <laughs> obvious like why are you even asking us this and and perhaps we have to and I have to learn that when compared to when I went to school mm. and we had to mm. learn certain things for our children growing up today, but again in European schools where the discussion is there, it's present and it's even, let's say, not a concern because it's taken for granted in terms of openness, in terms of not even bringing it into the conversation. So I think it's a little bit of both that we need to make sure that you have the protection, you have the awareness, you have the education and the training um, for, for the, let's say, the societies that are growing up, not to have to ask the questions or wonder whether they need to fight for something more. Is that enough? Of course not. And as we heard earlier, I mean, we have regression, we have backsliding, but we can also celebrate the fact that for uh, younger generations, this is something that they expect from their politicians, they expect from their teachers, from their activists in order to say, look, yes, this is something that, that we can all agree on. Far away, but I think we can manage. Uh, Tehrenke, you uh, are very engaged in activism uh, on LGBTIQ issues. Uh, you identify as a member of the community. How important is this to you? And how do you see this uh, progress as politician? Does this help you in your, 
in your oh, politics? She's, she's mm -hmm. the best, huh? She's the best, <laughs> to be clear. No, no, no. No, but you know, when, when Roberta was talking about this, like, uh, I, I used to be in a, in a secret relationship and because my partner did not want to come out. That was a very, very difficult experience for me. And then when I, when I uh, started to be in a relationship with my wonderful girlfriend, um, we talked about it and uh, I think we also jointly and very deliberately agreed that we want to be um, visual, that we want to be visible in society um, with who we are, that we are in a, in a lesbian relationship with each other. Because I think that at the end of the day, when then you, know, you have people who are so obviously part of the community, um, it also becomes something um, that is much more just accepted that, you know, people don't even think about or talk about or make an issue about so much anymore. Mm -hmm. So I felt that um, this was something um, that would help to, to just speak about it, to make people see that this is a completely normal way of having a family life. Um, and I still hope, I know that yesterday, um, I think second league uh, football player, came, a 17 yes. year old um, second league uh, football player came out in the UK, um, which mm -hmm. I only have uh, a lot of admiration for, um, because I think especially for male football players, it is still a very big challenge to overcome. Um, and I think uh, we have to show this admiration, we have to show the support because this really takes courage. Um, and then I hope that not only in politics, but as you say, in arts, in academia, in sports, everywhere, because LGBTI people are everywhere. We are part of this society and um, that's why I also think that we should be visible everywhere where we are. Um, and yeah, in politics, in, in sports and uh, wherever it's needed. And I hope with that actually then Maybe in a couple of years, we don't even have to talk about it so much anymore. Yeah. We don't need an Ida Hobbit specifically anymore because it's just so accepted in society um, that, that we don't, oh, we can raise our rainbow flags every day. Uh, uh, yes. Very yes, now, uh, we have enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confident that, that they will arrive, that, because young Absolutely. people are so open. They, for them, it's not a problem. And coming out, maybe in a few years, nobody has to come out. Just live your life, exactly. you know? Do you know that any... That was going any to be my question, for yeah. how long do we still need to do this? Well, uh, I hope not for that long, because I'm, I, I'm very confident in the youth. And uh, now with the conference in the future of Europe, I met so many young people and mm. the, this parliament engaged in, so, in bringing so many young people together. And when I address this, the subject of LGBTI rights, it's such a normality yes. for them. And as I said, I hope that in a few years, nobody has to come out. You just live your life. Do you know any straight uh, uh, teenager, 16, going to his parents and telling, or her parents and telling, hey, mommy, I have to tell you something, I'm heterosexual, or I, you know? And this would be the ideal that just live your life. Exactly. You have a boyfriend, then people say, okay, he's gay. You have a girlfriend as a woman, lesbian. If you're trans, non-binary, just live your life. And then I'm, I'm sure that uh, in, in, in decades to come, if we fight this anti-gender movement and we don't, we push them back, then uh, this will happen and people can live uh, the way they want without uh, being discriminated. That's what we are fighting for. Yes. Absolutely. We're reaching the end of this uh, discussion, but I want a short message from all of you uh, regarding Ukraine. It had, uh, the war in Ukraine has driven so many women, especially and LGBTIQ people across the border, especially trans women and men, uh, to Hungary, Poland and other EU countries, uh, whose identity may not be recognized in these countries. So uh, what, in your view, should member states, EU uh, states, uh, do to protect uh, uh, their rights? Uh, well, for me, uh, I uh, think that we should be quite concerned about what we are hearing about reports of trafficking uh, of women mm -hmm. uh, in many countries, uh, Ukrainian women and girls. So this is something that we are pushing now the, also the, the Commission to, to look at the legislation and see whether that, that can be a specific uh, framework of protection. We see it every time. Uh, there is an influx of members from a third country. We saw it in 2015 with the influx from Syria, and we are seeing it again now. Uh, I think our message has to be consistent. Uh, Europe has opened uh, its, its heart and its homes 
for uh, Ukrainian um, uh, elderly people, persons with a disability, women and children. I saw them myself um, when, I, when I went there. Uh, and I think the rights that they are afforded uh, should be the same like every other citizen of the European Union and everyone else mm -hmm. living in the European Union um, should be afforded. And that means that if we need to protect them and call out where discrimination is taking place, we should do it no matter where that happens. And again, our fantastic European Parliament Research Service has done a study on, uh, on the effects of uh, LGBTI people, the consequences in the, uh, of the Ukraine war. And um, uh, there's a few problems. First of all, we know that uh, trans uh, women with, gender, uh, with male gender marker in their passports, they're not allowed to leave yeah. Ukraine. That's already a huge yes. problem. And those who can leave, there is problems with hormonal treatments. Yeah. We have to en ensure that they have access to health and uh, some countries do not provide them this hormonal treatment. So uh, here, civil society, ILGA Europe was very active in, mm. in doing this, but this is something we have to ensure. We also know that Ukraine is, is the country with one of the highest HIV prevalence in the European Union. And they're not and getting treatment. And I've been, yes. an, uh, uh, I've been an activist in, and uh, an ambassador for UNAIDS, and I know how important it is. Yeah. And we have to support also Ukraine to send medical, to send treatments, because there have been uh, um, supply chain, uh, uh, supply chain uh, disruptions. So we have to support the people who stayed in the Ukraine, but also those who, who managed to flee, that they get their treatments. Uh, be it HIV treatment for those who are infected with HIV, be it for trans persons who are in transition or intersex person who need hormones, and it's very important to ensure that. And, um, uh, and that's uh, uh, something uh, I'm very happy that uh, the activists, Europe, uh, ILGA Europe and others are, are really a active on, on it. Uh, can I just, yeah, so can comment, I just because I completely yeah. agree with everything that you said, and I think specifically also now looking at the large number of refugees yeah. coming from Ukraine, but maybe it's also a good reminder that in general the EU's refugees policy needs very, very urgent reform yeah. because we were so, speaking a lot about fundamental rights and the fundamental so, rights of a lot of refugees uh, trying to find shelter inside of the European Union at, at yeah. the external borders are really being, we say in German, kicked with the foot. So um, we really need to work on this, and I yeah. hope that now with the situation yeah. that we have, with the great challenge that we have, that maybe there is also going to be movement. We know that certain member states have blocked progress uh, in this field. We really urgently need to work on what we have. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, with this situation now, we can actually uh, bring some dynamic into this discussion. In one very short question, your message to the LGBTIQ community out there. Be who you are, love who you love, be proud of all your colors, and we are going to support you. We, as a European Parliament, uh, are here to be your beacon of hope uh, and we will not let you down. You're welcome in the European Union. Thank you very much for this discussion. I really appreciate it and enjoyed it. I will finish this, uh, um, this uh, live stream with a comment from one of our viewers from YouTube, uh, Cosmane, if I'm not wrong. No one should be disadvantaged because of their gender. Uh, all people are weak, equal, and everyone should be given the same chance. Thank you very much for following this discussion, and see you soon in future live streamings. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.